Welcome back. I am here with Preston Dennett and Dolly Safran, two amazing guests. Dolly's here for the first time. Preston's been here many times. Today, we're going to talk about shadow people. Now, there are a lot of conceptions about shadow people ranging from the the scariest kind of hat man pieces where they're cast as malevolent entities. Sometimes they're described as manifestations of the men in black phenomena. Sometimes they're confused with ET experiences. Doctors will blame it on sleep paralysis. And sometimes it's confusion with an out of body experience. So I don't know which one of those it is, or if it's any or all, but hopefully Preston and Dolly can shed some light on the phenomena. So Preston, let's start with you at least to just go through the baseline behind this, the folklore behind it, what people claim to see, and then Dolly will provide some clarification on her experiences. Preston, go ahead. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting about shadow people is that this is not something I heard early on in my research. You know, I got involved in the field of UFOs and the paranormal in the late 1980s. And there was really no talk about shadow people. So this is somewhat recent and it seemed to really picked up in terms of interest and perhaps experiences as well. I don't know. I think you're right, Sean, that there's quite a bit of stuff being put under the shadow person umbrella and people are conflating various phenomena and i have to tell you i have gotten some shadow people cases including dolly she described them to me and there was a guy in england or is who started explaining his experiences with shadow people he is a contactee and this does seem to be something a lot of contactees uh, are dealing with but definitely not only so before I came on the show, I started looking up shadow people because you know, I wanted to educate myself on the subject. And I was surprised to see quite a bit of variation there. And some people describing what are clearly to me, spirits, regular, honest to God, ghosts. Other people describing what I think are probably demonic spirits or dark inhuman spirits of some kind, which does seem to be a real phenomena. I've certainly got cases of that. So I think there is a bit of confusion going on here on what we're defining here as a shadow person. But as near as I can understand it, when people describe a shadow person, they're not seeing your average apparition of an old timey ghost mm -hmm. wearing old clothes or anything like this. These are quite specific in their descriptions of being something that's very dark, darker than black, almost absorbing light, can be quite short or tall, generally human in shape. Some are describing it wearing a hat. I don't know what that is. That to me is really quite odd because I don't even know what to make of that, honestly. Those tend to be the most negative experiences. Like people, when they see that quote unquote hat man, they report feeling a, a sense of extreme malevolence, yep. but it, it's typically associated with that particular figure. And then uh, they see that that entity is kind of a director of sorts where there are other shadow beings that'll come in and follow. But again, these are just what's reported. I don't have any sense of what's real and what's not. Yeah. Well, they're usually seen out of the corner of one's eye. It's not something that comes right up and stands in front of you. Generally speaking, it's not always true. Some people do report a lot of fear surrounding these figures. It's usually not a one-time experience for people from what I'm reading and actually from you know the people I've interviewed. Uh, it's something that they see quite often and they seem to be not so much malevolent. I couldn't find any cases just now of them actually hurting people. Though so some feel that they are manipulating the environment to a degree, and that makes me wonder if we're describing other types of spirits here. I'm sure Dolly does have something to say about this, but yeah, they're described often as not fully formed, kind of almost a two-dimensional aspect to them. And there's a number of people who say, oh, I'm paralyzed. I couldn't move. <laughs> they felt a malevolent energy coming out of them. And others say, oh, no, they're just kind of curious, poking their head around the corner. So there's quite a bit 
going on here that needs to be unpacked, I think. I don't think that there have been people who've been extremely physically harmed, but I think the times there's been scratches or something like that on, on some people who have the more malevolent experiences. That, that would be demonic. That's a demonic spirit thing, which are inhuman spirits who presumably, according to traditional religious doctrine, <laughs> have never been human. And I think that that's probably the case. It's very hard to say for sure, because how would you ever prove something like that? Right. And, and in Lorraine Warren, who are prominent demonologists, talked about human ghosts being demonic. And I'm not sure that that's the case. I mean, someone can go down that route and choose evil. But yeah, when people are dealing with a, a, a demonic spirit, scratches on one's back or leg, usually three in a row, is sort of a mocking of the Holy Trinity is what usually takes place. And so if someone's getting scratched, I'm not so sure that's a shadow person. But yeah, so I think there's mostly the problem here is the conflating of demonic spirits and shadow people, which I'm not convinced are the same. Yeah, I, I think given the wide range of reports, I, I think lumping them into one basket is, to your point, is probably not the best thing to do because there's very distinct experiences that people have that are very malevolent and there are others that are kind of benign. So I can totally see how this could be unnaturally grouped in one basket that isn't one basket. So in some of the experiences that you're describing as potentially demonic, and I don't want to get too much into it. I want to try to keep a scientific basis for a lot of this stuff. When we say demonic, it's more akin to something we just don't fully understand in the non-physical realm. I will say, you know, having investigated a number of hauntings, there is a difference between your average aunt to be showing up or a go you know a haunted house a demonic haunting follows a pretty set pattern which starts out sometimes with people messing around with witchcraft or a ouija board or something untoward <laughs> but we'll start with knockings scratchings on the walls and usually targets one person in the family and becomes a very they're malevolent spirits. They're trying to scare a person. And usually when they do manifest, it's a very tall, black, dark apparition, mm -hmm. which moves to infestation. And the last stage would be possession, which does happen in some cases. These dark things will move right into you, attack you. I do have a few cases of that. And these are clearly not your average haunting. So there is a difference there. Or whatever these things are, the pattern is pretty well established. Yeah, and, and not to get too much into theology because I want to steer away from this, but people who often encounter this hat man entity claim that if they invoke the name of Jesus Christ, he actually will leave or back away. Again, I'm just reporting this. I don't know if there's any meaning to that. Obviously, in Catholic exorcisms, the name of Christ is invoked and has been effective in driving out some of these entities. So, well, uh, you know, I don't want to go to do that. <laughs> he was having all kinds of problems that finally did attack him. And he's not religious, but he invoked not only Jesus, but Buddha and started going down the list. Yeah, like great religious figures, right. And it seemed to work. It lifted off of him. It was pressing him down on the bed. It was quite alarming to him. Is this the case you had in Britain? No, no. This is a case in the San Fernando Valley in California. Yeah. Okay. It's a haunt, uh, so, a pol so oh, it was a poltergeist haunting. Okay, so let's let's talk about the the case you had in Britain, and then we'll move to to Dolly's case because I think it, it sounds like these two might be the same, but different than the more malevolent manifestations. Of, or not? It's not. It's a different, completely different entity or series of entities. It sounds like so. Let's talk a little bit about the British case first. Yeah, this was a gentleman, a really nice guy, factory worker, who's had encounters with ETs his whole life. And as many people who are contactees, they start to experience quite a wide variety of paranormal events. Uh, he became quite psychic, having out-of-body experiences and premonitions and seeing ghosts, standard little ghostly dog walking through the house, a ghostly figure dressed in old-time clothes, and he started saying, have you heard of shadow people? 
I'm like, well, yeah, I heard, you know, a couple of people have mentioned them to me. And I wasn't quite sure what to make of them. And they described, yeah, seeing these sh usually short little figures. And he said that he would be watching TV and he would see movement out of the corner of his eye and look. And as he turned his head and looked at these things, he would see a human figure. He said it was about six feet tall, kind of flattish looking, almost two dimensional, pitch black. I mean, sucking up the light kind of black. He says it was darker than black, like a hole in reality almost. And as soon as he would look at it, it would flit away. And he said it would often happen at night in his bedroom when he was watching TV. It happened dozens of times. He was reporting a wide variety of paranormal events. It wasn't just this. But this is something that concerned him because they kept showing up and never pestered him, never hurt him, but were like always there. <laughs> it really concerned him. His wife saw them too, so it wasn't just him. You know, these were actually physically manifesting in his bedroom, almost exclusively in his bedroom. And he never could get a really good look at him because anytime he stared at it directly, off it would go, which is what I've heard from other people. His was the most complete account and the one that I really started to dig into because I'm like, okay, maybe this is a thing. I had kind of just assumed that people were describing spirits. But this does, yeah, again, appear to be slightly different. This is something that he's still experiencing. I did talk to him not too long ago, a couple of weeks. So he's kind of gotten used to what he says. <laughs> uh, I think if you have an experience over and over again and you get through it, you realize, okay, this is not here to hurt me. So he doesn't feel like this is a malevolent evil thing, but he doesn't like it because he doesn't know what it is. And I think that's where a lot of the fear comes from. When you're confronted with something you absolutely can't explain, I think that's where the fear starts. Now, is the source of it the fact that he experienced ET contact, or is it those experiences somehow opened up his psychic abilities exactly. and now he's seeing these things? Yeah, that's my assessment because people are always asking me, you know, what's the connection between UFOs and the paranormal? Because there is. I really researched into this, trying to come up with a theory that really fits the evidence. And what I'm seeing is, yes, the ET contact experience, like a near-death experience for that matter, there's a whole variety of ways that people can suddenly have their awareness elevated. But I think that's exactly what's happening. People become more consciously aware. Their awareness is, jumps up a level and the contact experience will often result in people having mediumship. He has a lot of out-of-body experiences. And I asked him about that. I'm like, do you think that's related to your UFO contact. He says, yes, absolutely, I do. It's the real positive thing he's gotten out of it because he doesn't like seeing the grays. But this is a pattern I've noticed, and I absolutely think this is the connection between UFOs and the paranormal because often that's what happens. People will have a series of contacts, and the next thing you know, they're levitating or have the ability to heal or channeling or doing psychic visions and mediumship. It's very prominent. So people will start seeing things that they never saw before, energy, auras, all of this. So what he's seeing has probably already been there. <laughs> he just wasn't aware of it. But it's interesting to me that a lot of people who describe this do see it out of the periphery of their vision, which as a paranormal researcher, I think paranormal researchers will echo this, that ghosts are often seen out of the periphery of your vision. Which I'm not sure why. Because you're not seeing with your eyes, you're seeing with your third eye. You're, and, and then the, and you, the third your psychic ability is seeing it, and your brain is interpreting it as coming from the side. And when you say with your third eye, you're talking about the pineal gland or yes, pineal, the pineal gland? Yes. Pineal gland. So here, here's an interesting aside. Are either of you familiar with Dr. Gar Gary Nolan at Stanford Medical School? Only peripherally. <laughs> okay, so what what he had been doing is the Defense Department would go to him with medical cases. Some were associated with Havana Syndrome. Some were associated with paranormal experiences. I, I believe, and you know, military personnel who had either seen a UFO 
or had interacted with some sort of paranormal entities, activity, phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch, as an example, when the DIA was there back in the late aughts. And what he is finding is that there's a structure in the brain, two structures, the caudate and the patillman, and those structures are responsible for, to my understanding, learning. And there's this clustering of neurons can connective tissue between the two that is different in people who have these experiences. Now, I haven't seen it. I don't know if there's been a conclusion. I just haven't seen it yet. It is unclear to me if these experiences cause that. Initially, it looked like scarring to him, but it's unclear if those experiences cause it or if that brain structure was slightly different to begin it's, with. It's, it'll- it's dormant or not dormant. It's If you use it, it builds up, it becomes bigger in the brain. In other words, it's like a muscle. You flex the muscle, it gets bigger. In your psychic ability, in all of your innate abilities, in your brain, if you don't use them, they lay flashly and don't work at all. The minute you start employing that ability, your brain develops and those neurons, all of it, starts to swell up. What's interesting about Einstein's brain is that parts of his brain, the lobe and, and near the medulla oblongata, were huge. And they couldn't understand that. It was very overdeveloped. And you're talking about the same places that he is finding. He, I think Einstein's brain sent him in that direction. And this was so well used. Intuitively, Einstein could just gather information out of anywhere. If they had had yeah. Tesla's brain, they would have seen the same thing. If you're psychic, you're psychic, and they can see that you've developed it. If you're not, they can see that you haven't developed it yet. Yeah, you raise a very interesting point because Einstein's genius was very intuitive. It wasn't like left brainy sort yes. of, right? Because you have like the Dirac's of the world who were very left brainy, like lots of equations and things like that, whereas Einstein was extremely intuitive. So, in this phenomenon, Dolly, just to read back what you're saying. So like in any aspect of the brain, the neural pathway can be developed or exactly. not, yes. which leads to my follow-up question. Is this something when people get older, a lot of your neural pathways shut down or your, your brain becomes less plastic, right? If you, use it, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's exactly right. If you constantly employ your ability to learn, to understand and to consider everything, your brain stays good. But if you, there are two things operating here. We're also living in a world that's polluted and there are chemicals that we're ingesting that actually harm our brains and have been for a long time. So a lot of dementias and things like that are a direct result of that pollution. I think the human mind, if it stays healthy and it's used, can develop into anything. Your abilities are out. So, you know, part of this question is later in life, let's say somebody's 70 years old and they've never had a psychic experience. Is the brain so closed off at that point that they'll never develop this ability? Or with concentration and work, can they develop it? In other words, is it like learning a new musical intru- instrument or foreign if you language plug at that in, age? It'll turn on. Period. Okay. That's why ET contact has that effect on people, no matter what age you are, even into your high 80s, 90s, 100s. If they communicate with you and they stimulate that part of your brain in that communication, it kind of flips the switch. And your brain will go, oh, I like this. And it'll keep trying. The more contact you have with them, the more it'll happen. And then they'll wake up and they'll realize, oh, I need to use this. And they'll keep going. And I have seen people in their 70s and 80s develop psychic ability that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and I would echo that because there's this phenomenon with children who are much more prone to have psychic experiences, past life recalls, see ghosts. In my files, children are the ones who see a lot of ghosts. And you see that with very old people because they're both very close to source, where we came from or where we're going. And there's a phenomenon called near or uh, deathbed visions. And when someone is ready to go, <laughs> um, they, they, they will see yeah. all their family members around them. This is very well documented. 
right. and people are in the room when a person is passing away or within days of passing away. And they're like, oh my gosh, I saw my parents. They're there. Can you see them? And these are generally very old people. That's because the physical mind is giving up control and the consciousness is actually activated to the point that it's letting everybody know it's there. This is all relevant, but it's just a very fascinating. And I think trying to elucidate some of this stuff. All right, I'll do this. I'll do a quick aside, but I've done this in another episode, so I'll, I will make it super quick. Okay. So this is an experience with my four-year-old son. So you know, we, we test him and ask him questions on things that are easy to get right by chance. Like what color is the rental car going to be, right? And he said white twice in a row, and he's always been right. But 38% of cars are white. And the probability of getting it right tw twice in a row is 14%. And he just says white consistently. So a skeptic can easily write that off. But one day we get two Amazon packages. He runs to one package. It's sent from somebody else in my family. So my wife and I don't know what's in it. Now, if I shook the box, I could tell it was a book. So I won't give him any credit for that. But he runs to the box right away, picks it up, takes it to my wife and says, Avengers book. And again, her and I don't know what's in it. So it's not telepathy. It's not anything like that. So we open the box and there's an Avengers book. So yes. anyway. Preston does this constantly. He can touch anything and tell you what it is. Not anything, but yeah. Well, this, damn close. <laughs> one of my things I learned I could do because you get gifts. And it's fun and it's fun to guess. And I started getting really good at it. <laughs> Very specific, like a red helmet for my nephew. I picked up the, the box, I knew it. My sister-in-law gave me a gift. She's knowing I could sometimes do this. She's like, what do you think it is? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I honestly don't know. I keep getting this weird image of a caged animal <laughs> and I couldn't quite pin it down. And she's like, open it, open it. Cause she, <laughs> she lit up when I said that. And it was a brass elephant. And I'm like, oh, I was close. But I mean, sometimes I'm spot on. This is something anyone can do. It's remote viewing is essentially right. what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's very similar to remote viewing. It's not the best use case of remote viewing. I, I just say this because it, it drives David Morehouse nuts because that's how <laughs> Russell Targ would train people to do it. Al, I think your father was like a ranger, right? Yeah. No yeah, so, i.e. army ranger, not like a... Like army, a, infantry, yes. So David Morehouse commanded a ranger company. So he's a former ranger and he's just like, you know, what he's company? all about I think what year? Bravo company. It was back in the mid eighties. He was in Panama, not in the actual invasion, but he was near the border of Nicaragua. Well, I won't say anything more than that. Ask him but. if he remembers Mr. Farlow, Sergeant Farley. Sergeant Farley? Yeah, okay. Farlow, F-A-R-L-O-W. He was with okay. them. Yeah. I know when, who you're when, talking about now. Yeah. I'm oh, you know? With Rangers. I supported the uh, 75th Range Regiment. I couldn't be yeah. one, so I supported them. Yeah. Yeah. But he went from there to the DIA exactly. and, and then went to the intelligence support activity, which is like Task Force Orange, things like that. Like stuff that nobody knew existed back then. Right. And even now... They're only recently figuring out, but it's like uh, the army's version of the human intelligence side of the CIA. Rangers lead the way. They're yeah, but not when he was a ranger. After after he did his yeah. his ranger. Yeah, I know, but his career would have taken him in that direction. Correct. Yeah, he was in the remote viewing program for three years. It was a complete departure. Well, actually, here's a here's a way to figure it out. Did your father deploy to Jordan as My part of the training? My father passed away in 2014. Um, my father was 81 when he passed. Um, my father fought in Korea, Indochina, and Vietnam. So Okay. When, and, when did he get out? How did he get out? I don't think he really ever did. <laughs> he was working for the Army all the way through my life till he died. So, yeah. Okay. I, I can't so, talk about what he did. Um, he, he also worked for NASA. You know, the uh, space shell program. You know, the boosters like, fall back and they redeploy them. He did all the shoots and all the shoot packing plants for that. And, okay. Um, stuff like that. So I grew up around all that. And he did other things that I absolutely will not talk about. So, but yeah. 
yeah, it's an interesting career path, let's just say. So anyway, sorry, getting back on track. Let's talk about your experiences with Shadow People, Dolly. Okay. I am a contact, which we'll talk about later. I am one open psychic. I was raised by ET. I spent as much time with them as I did here my whole life. I live a dual existence. I developed my abilities very young, and so I see energy all the time. And I perceive things because I'm wide open. When I was in my late 30s, I started noticing that this being was hanging out with me, and it would tease me. And I was confused because it's non corporeal. It has no body, really. It's a shadow. And I, the first notice I had was I thought I had two shadows for a while. I'd be walking along and I'd see the second shadow. I'm like, what the heck? Okay. And then it finally confronted me. And it showed up in my room at night. And it was standing next to me. And they don't really have a body, but you can see them try to either surround you or come up against you, you know, they're looking at you. And I realized they have eyes, <laughs> very interesting eyes. And I'm like, who are you? And uh, it jumped back because it realized I was looking at it. And uh, I said, don't be messing with me. And it jumped back and hopped up and down and twirled around the room. And I was like, what the hell? And it went right out the wall. I'm like, okay, it's on. I'm going to figure out who you are. And I've spent years going after this guy. So I don't know if it's male or female, what I call it. Anyway. It's a little short name. Have you ever asked your ETs what yeah. it was? My contact explained to me that I already know who he is, what he is, and why he is. But I have to <laughs> work at it. Yeah. Yes, it's not it. helpful. This right, was a right. new exercise for me. Okay. So this was my quest. And uh, I observed him. I watched him. I played with him. I chased him, physically chased him around. He started realizing that I wasn't going to leave him alone. The, the tables turned on him, okay? And uh, he would do stuff to really irritate me, and I would do the same. I realized that I had control over how much contact I had with him or how little. It hit me profoundly when I was in Florida what I was dealing with. And I asked him. I asked Kalata, my contact. He's two dimensional. He only has two bloody sides. He is non corporeal and he is conscious. He thinks. He blew me away. And then the quest was get a picture of him, okay? And I ran around with my camera all the time. I could not. It took me years, okay? One night I pissed him off so bad he shot me a bird. And when he did, I went click. He had manifested somewhat, and I got him on film. I sent you the picture. I've realized that they are second dimensional beings. They have no DNA, so they're ethereal, okay? And they have a limited existence. And what's interesting to me is that they can see us, which isn't usual unless you're psychic. So instantly I realized he was psychic as well. That's how I knew he had consciousness, okay? You can't have be psychic without consciousness, okay? We could see into other dimensions if you're wide open psychic. I can. I know you could if you try. I've been trying, Dolly. I don't. <laughs> I'm like, stop trying. You can do it. I'm like the lowest <laughs> IQ. If, 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 if psychics had an IQ and the average was 100, I'd be at 30. Oh, no. You're smart enough. <laughs> you're smart enough. <laughs> Trust me, that's amazing, okay? You're a smart guy. So I went back to Colada and I said, okay, I figured it out. And when I told him, he just smiled, a big smile and said, you got it. You understand. We live in a 12 dimensional construct. We're in the third dimension and there are beings below us from the second up. First dimension, I don't know what's laying there, except that maybe consciousness begins there. And then it maybe, it's the, maybe it's the singularity, something like I don't that's know. a point, right? I know that we're eternal. So I don't, I'm not sure about that. I wish I was. Uh, but I know that there's fourth dimension, fifth dimensional beings, all the way up to the 12th. I can see into the fifth dimension. I've dealt with fifth dimensional beings. Past that, not yet. 
Now, still- now, just to clarify, when you say fourth dimensional, that's a fourth physical dimension. They would be light beings. You would see them like angels. They're corporeal, but they're ethereal at the same time. They're losing the cohesion of their DNA, and they're ethereal, as I'll get out. They haven't proceeded into the fifth dimension yet. Fifth dimensional beings are non corporeal completely, but they're very strong. And ETs work with them. To a lot of my contacts, is a fifth dimensional being, and he dwells in the craft that we fly. All of their craft are somewhat biological, and it helps him anchor into the craft so that he can run it. Everything they do is psychic. And does that have something to do with when you manipulate gravity? Again, I'm wildly speculating, so you can shoot me down, but it seems if you need to traverse enormous distances, you either have to step up to a higher dimension because you can get farther, faster. It's kind of like flying, right? If you're on a two-dimensional map, basically, and you're driving, it takes longer to get somewhere than if you can pop up into the third dimension. Again, I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying it, but you can get can to your... give you a clear picture of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything is light. You're light. The reason you don't see it is we're in a heavy, gravity-heavy, and all of your molecules, your protons, everything are packed. So you don't see the light that you're emanating, but you are light. They, Everything is light. They are psychic to the point that they can bend light. Einstein was right that you had to bend space to go from one point to the other instantly. But right. as they bend light, they open the light gate to do it. That's how they bend it. And they go through. So they're going millions of light years across this gap, our universe, by bending the light through a light gate. That's how they travel. And what exactly is a light gate? It is a dimensional doorway that they open. That they're Okay, it's through. like a portal. It's a portal. I hate that word. It is not a portal. <laughs> A portal is a door that you walk through. A light gate is in your mind, you can see a point clean across the universe and be in contact with it. Your protons will communicate with that. You're in contact with it. The like quantum entanglement. It's the light of your consciousness amplified to open that gate and you go through it. Okay, so it's like somehow leveraging the principle of quantum entanglement. Very much so, yeah. Because each of us, have, again, I'm oversimplifying, each of us is stardust. And exactly. we are somehow linked to... I'm trying to think of the right word. All energy for this. is light. Always remember that. You're thinking uh, physical right now because you're here. Mm-hmm. Step away from that terminology in your mind. You are pure light. Your consciousness is light. Everything is like we're all connected. This is the one thing we all have in common clear across the universe is that if you're sentient, if you have consciousness, you're one of everything. Yeah, this becomes really apparent if you do an out of body experience, astral projection, because you can leap from one side of the universe to the other instantly, basically teleporting. And this is when you start to get visions of the future or visiting the past. Because if you can overcome any distance, well, rate times time equals distance, time sort of collapses on the other side. <laughs> it's, again, a simplification, but I think it sort of gets the point across that everything is light. On The higher you go astrally, I guess, it's very bright. It's very light. Everything on the other side glows in this weird way. <laughs> it's composed of light. So... Here on the third dimension, it's the same thing. It's just crystallized or frozen, kind of, in a weird way. The reason that we exist here right now, you come here, you plan to be here, and you're projecting out of light into this dimension, and you solidify with your DNA into a being that you ride in, you're you're driving this. You come here because you have all knowledge already, consciously, but you haven't deployed it, you haven't learn to make it part of your consciousness. That's how you elevate in wisdom. So we come here to learn. And then we go back and we ascend. Yeah, and going back to shadow people, I'm wondering, because you know we hear all about light beings 
coming from like the fourth dimension. If shadow beings are like Dolly says, two dimensional, well, that would make sense because they are a lower form of light. So I'm mean, completely, <laughs> if it's two dimensional, I like that theory actually. Because it makes sense that there's a dimension that's even slower than ours. <laughs> They're an entity just like you are. They have consciousness yeah. just like you do. They are there for a reason. They chose to be there. They're learning something there. We've already probably done that because we're here. Okay? There's no backsliding. So you got to start at some point. Whatever they're learning, they're learning, and they will jump up and ascend to you. They are in here with us. ET knows they exist. ET speaks them. ET knows that we can remote view. They remote view as well. ET sheds their bodies and begin anew, just like we do. We all meet in source. They're in source with us. We are all one, all of us. The difference in crossover stuff that's going on is that whatever entity you choose to be while you're in this third dimension, that's how you are projecting yourself to be and you're learning those lessons. Even a demon has to learn a lesson, and he's chosen that form to operate here. It's interesting to me about shadow people is they're human in form. <laughs> they're not blobs. Right. So this is, a, again, the template we see with life right. throughout well, the universe. universe. Right. That's all. But also, a question I had, Dolly, because I don't know if I've ever asked you this regarding your shadow people experiences, do they manipulate the environment? physical environment in any way he can i've seen him move objects it takes a lot for him to do it he has to like have enough energy to do it but he would i had we had a little glass gazing ball out in the yard and it sat on the grass and he rolled it around the yard he would move it 10 feet three feet okay here i'm going to tell you something I never said to you when my glasses disappear it's him he takes my glasses from me and hides them from me. And then suddenly I'll have four pair of glasses that I haven't seen in months. And it drives me crazy. And he does that to me. Yeah. So. Now, well, Dolly, Sean, Dolly came over to my house in California to go to a convention. And while she was visiting there, the house keys, which I had set on the table, disappeared. And we searched that. I mean, it's a little table. <laughs> There was some stuff on it, but we searched it, both of us. We looked at it 10 times. I'm like, Dolly, I put them here. They cannot go anywhere. I would not move the keys. Why would I move the keys? And we were tearing the house apart. Finally, I went back to the table. I'm like, Dolly, <laughs> come here. <laughs> Look, the keys are right there on the center of the table. There is no way. And she's like, see, this is what I put up with. So are, are you saying the shadow guy? Yeah. Mm, great. That was so annoying. I can't tell you because we were going to go out and I'm like, I'm not leaving the house unless I have the keys. <laughs> Whenever I'm around, Dolly's stuff will happen. Interesting. So why are they behaving as tricksters? What are they? They want to attention. You have energy. They don't. You're very mm -hmm. bright to them. You are beautiful to them. And they want to hang out. They're not malicious. They're not malignant. They just want to be with you. And if you understood that, you might enjoy a relationship. So human beings are to shadow people like light beings or angels are to us. Yes. Because <laughs> they're a you know, fourth dimensional being, so we're another dimension to them. Yeah. The higher dimension. How, co how come we aren't as quote unquote enlightened as because you know, you're cut of angels your consciousness. Your consciousness knows all this, but you're you're in a physical body right now that's not listening to your consciousness because you've been steered away from it. I think it's great that you're encouraging child to use the psychic abilities and to not think he's wrong for it, okay? Let him develop. He will do amazing things. Practice with him. Open the dialogue in your mind because the more psychic you open up to be, the more you hear the truth, the more you are educated by your consciousness because your physical mind isn't who you are. This is your consciousness, and it's trying desperately to talk to you right now. But we've had a hundred years or more of somebody telling you you're an idiot, bad, or demon for using it. Okay, we need to change our thought patterns for this. The paradigm shift is this go from being unaware.
to aware and understanding what that means and how it operates, period. Do you think to some extent, and I don't mean to steer, I, I'm, I'm taking this interview where I think is more interesting paths or to, to, you know, some of the interesting paths that are coming up. So forgive me if I keep deviating from shadow people, audience, for, please forgive me. Do you think there's a deliberate effort to suppress some of this stuff? And again, let me, let me step back. If I put myself into kind of the defense, not even the defense establishment, but people who are you know, controlling the world, right? And there's, you know, there, many people have many parts in it, but people at the very tippity top who are the most wealthy and things like that, having a world where suddenly everyone was either psychokinetic, telepathic, et cetera, could be highly disruptive if it happened all at once. Correct. You couldn't hide secrets, which for the military would be dangerous because there's some secrets that are worth hiding. But also there's some people who shouldn't be hiding secrets that would be exposed and potentially torn down given I want, I want the to put this I want to put this flat on the table. Okay. We exist not in open truth with one another. We exist with paranoia, fear, lies, and outright power over us. We are slaves already. Don't doubt it. Everything you do is guided by somebody else, and you are told how to exist. You're told how to think. They can get what they want from you any other way, and they have reasons. Okay, let's now, now, who's they? The 1% of the world who've okay. been here for all time here and have been operating and developing themselves a way to keep you under control. They don't use the whip. They now use money and they use things. They use pleasure. They use hate. They use fear. It's incredible. And if you sit down and critically look at your life and what's existing and how you're operating in it, it's obvious. And that's why it's time to wake up. And one of the reasons that people are now seeing all this phenomenon all at once People are seeing shadow people. They're having more psychic abilities. They're understanding that they're oppressed and that their autonomy is gone is because they are waking up. ET is very, trying very hard. They broadcast to this planet every day. They talk to people individually. They have contact with every one of us and tried to begin training us to walk into this change of thinking. The more we work at it, the stronger we become in knowledge and understanding of this, the more we will be able to push back that paradigm of ownership of us, period. Yeah, I think what I've seen in the last decade, particularly with politicians, is I I, I, I don't like <laughs> I'm done. Like. They're just not bright. Like, and, and, and I'm kind of, if there were a pathway to circumvent that authority in a way that was positive, but just went directly to source, it just went around them Wake up. to learn, learn up. more about your power is from within you change yourself first, help everybody else to seek that path. And it will go ding, 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 ding. And it will happen. He keeps banking on it. They want it to happen for us. They want us to use our abilities because it all comes down to this. You either love humanity and we love one another and we care about the fact that we are one or we're no better than that. Period. The thing that's most frustrating for me was where I was kind of almost done is the UAP videos where it's clear as day what's going on. And you still have people who are like, oh, no, those, that's a drone. Like <laughs> drones don't move like that. Like they just they don't. Our drones uh, do move like that. They're back engineered. ET has drones like that. They are drones. What you're seeing in there, those tic tacs are drones. They're back engineered drones. I want you to know something. ET is not here right now. They haven't been here for a while. They're not going to be. Our magnetic sphere is so far down that they can't fly the magnetic field lines of this planet incoming 
energy from the sun is not being pushed away and it attacks them. They can, it attacks us too. We've lost satellites in midair being launched because of it. Our computers go down, our GPS goes down, our planet is locking up, it's a big deal. They have to wait now before they can come back. It's in our solar system, it's also in the galaxy. This 12,000 year cycle is a giant energy stream that sluices through our galaxy and we're in its direct path right now. And they don't dare fly here. They do have drones here and they do have sentinels in our solar system that are watching the situation. When our poles finally finish shifting, they got a window of opportunity and they will show at that point. But they want us to be ready for it. And they want us to be aware of what the governments of the world know about this situation and what they're doing to us. That's an interesting point you make because I, uh, there is scientific evidence that the poles shift. I want to say it's roughly 10,000 years because at least that's what they find the polarity of I iron filings in the ocean as the tectonic plates spread. They reverse or shift. They don't tell um, you the whole truth. It's 12,000 years set up. Well, that, that, was the, the that, that was the cycle. It's called the NOAA event. And our planet walks over because we're going to micronova and the energy of it will knock us over. We're breaking loose from our mantle right now. And once that finishes kicking off, the sun microwaves and it'll, the energy will impact us. If you want to know what killed the dinosaurs, there you go. That 12, you can, you can look this up online on yeah. look, researching magnetic fields and the coronal mass ejections, CMEs, and the history of that. Oh, yeah, it's like that an EMP. Like, I think the Carrington incident was the was a, that was, was a shot across our bow. That was the warning. Mm -hmm. That got the world government's attention all by itself. And they went rogue and they went underground and they're ready for what they think they're going to survive. And we're expendable. They're the 1% elite who think they deserve it more than we do. That's not yeah. well. Well, <laughs> if, not all. It, if what people who have NDEs report is true, you just reincarnate into something else. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the whole point. Preston calls this good news. Okay. <laughs> you can choose. You, you either get to move on and just go somewhere else, or you get to stay here, try to survive it, and take a ride with ET because they will come pick everybody up who's left. Yeah, it is good so, news. Okay. Life on Earth has been terrible for <laughs> hundreds upon hundreds of years, and we've We're slowly interested. progressed. <laughs> But we're still way down the wrong path. We should not be living like this. We should not have to work all day long for just food and shelter and not even have enough money to get that. I mean, it's ridiculous. <gasps> so, yeah, this is not sustainable the way we're living. We've polluted every darn river, lake. The oceans are filled with plastic. <sighs> it's a mess. Yeah, not everybody gets to learn. Not everybody gets to become wise. While you're trying to survive all the time, you don't have time to devote to your mind and your ability. Yeah, I totally agree. Any final words on shadow people? And then before we talk about the next. If you see one, question it. Don't be afraid of it. Just critically look at it, observe it, become a scientist yourself. Convince yourself of what you're looking at. Shine a light on it if you have to. But don't stop and be afraid of something you don't understand without trying first to understand it. And you'll interestingly find out that you can develop a relationship with this being. Yeah, and I would say just be aware that these things do exist. They're being widely reported. And use a critical eye when you're looking at these things. What exactly are you looking at? <laughs> Write it down. So I, I agree with Dolly. This is a new area of exploration and uh, research, I think, that is a wonderful opportunity. Because as I said, there wasn't really any talk about this as being a separate category. And now we're getting to the point where we're really starting to discern differences between ETs and spirits and light beings and you know nature spirits even, and what have you. So this is an opportunity to really figure out how our universe works. All right. Well, thank you both. It was an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you both in the next episode. Okay. Awesome. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.